Good morning, GCAF. Good morning. We praise and thank God for this wonderful day that He has given to all of us. Do you know that this day is a special day for the fathers out there? Well, happy Father's Day, mga amahan. If there is a father beside you, please greet them. Happy Father's Day. Yay. <laughs> Yay. It's a really a great day to see everybody, not just the fathers, but the whole family gathered together. Um, the mothers, the sons, the daughters, the aunties, the, the uncles, and everybody uh, gathering together as one corporately, worshiping the Lord in singing songs, worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. We praise the Lord for this beautiful day that He has given to all of us. So uh, this day will be the part two of our message that was shared to us last week by Pastor David. And if you have your Bibles with you, please open it with me in the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 1, verses 18 to 23. Uh, verses 18 to 23. And uh, the title of our message today is, I, I titled it, The Gospel of True Prosperity. The Gospel of True Prosperity. Let us begin by reading God's Word, uh, these few verses um, that is given to us by God through His Word. This is Paul. Again, the prayer of Paul. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of His might, which he, bo he brought about in Christ when He raised Him up from the dead and seated Him at the right hand in the heavenly places. For far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the one to come. And He put all things in subjection under His feet and gave Him as head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. May the Lord bless the reading of His Word. Now, if there are two takeaways or lessons that I had last week with the message of, uh, of past, the part one of this message, it's this one, the first one. It's a deeper appreciation of grace and faith working together as I teach God's Word to God's people and spe specifically to my family, to my children. I realized last week that it's really by God's grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that the revelation of God's Word will make sense to us no matter how hard I I give my all in teaching God's Word. Apart from the sealing and the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit, all is in vain. And many times, you know, with our desire to really teach our kids to, or to pass on our faith to them, a faith that really treasures God as the number one in everything, sometimes we get frustrated because uh, they, they just don't get it at times, you know, which is why we try even harder. We try even harder at the times we get frustrated even on the way that we teach them. But I realize that it's really, it goes back, you know, to walking by faith and not by sight. Because if not for the Holy Spirit to open up their minds and open up their hearts, all the things that we teach from His Word will only stay in our heads and, not, and, not, and it will not you know, uh, result into a transformed lives. So everything that we do, again, goes back to the grace of God and the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, as I was reading God's Word throughout this week, those are you know, the echoes that comes to my mind and to my heart. Now, the second uh, lesson that I learned or the takeaway that I had was, you know, I was really encouraged by uh, the preaching of Pastor David, which is why I took my wife and for the first time in almost three years, I went 
and watch the movie, a movie in the cinema. <laughs> um, some of you probably did that. You know, that's your takeaway. That's my takeaway also, the second takeaway. Uh, and I watched a movie, a movie date with uh, Bon Bon, and we watched Tom Cruise's movie. You know, um, and many of you have watched that, and it's such a an adventure. Thank you, <laughs> David, for sharing to us, for encouraging me, you know, to take my wife on a date. But um, you know, Hollywood. Let's say, let's talk about Hollywood. You know, it's a premier. Many would consider it as the premier storyteller of our time, right? It takes us on a roller coaster ride with so many emotions from the different genres of movies that we see. And which is why for many of us who went through almost three years of uh, lockdowns and, and pandemic, uh, we, it, it went by so fast with help of the movies that we, we see in Netflix or whatever Korea, Korean novellas uh, that you are into, you know. Uh, it's just a wonderful um, avenue where people get to tell a story. But again, just like uh, Siguro Si Mam Ao, who is the storyteller of their family, nothing beats a story of your aunties and uncles and the lolos and lolas in your parents, isn't it? For me, um, that's the best stories that I have. Those are the best stories that I have heard of in life. Um, you know, the uncles who tell such funny stories that would crack you up, will make your tummy hurt, you know, until you are out of breath. And there are stories also, especially during brownouts, you know, sa, sa bukid sa una, pirmi brownout in the evening and your aunties and, and ma mothers and fathers would tell you scary stories and it haunts you even up until now. You know, you're afraid now to take a shower on your own because the scary story might get you. you know, um, those are stories that, you know, you, I, 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 I look to and I treasure because nothing beats a good old story of your uh, Lolo and Lola. But as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, Siguro, uh, I want to ask you this question. What stories do you tell when you talk about your life? Or how do you portray the story of God in your life as you live it on a daily basis? What stories do you tell? Are these stories help other people be encouraged in times of uh, oil price hike? In times when our fuel is nearing up to 100 pesos, and which is why many of us would opt to walk, especially when your workplace is near your house. And I am trying to do that. Uh, and I am happy that some of our staff, instead of riding their motor, they are riding their bicycles already in coming to GCAF. Um, but what stories do we tell? On, or how do we portray the story of the goodness of God in our lives? Does it encourage people in times like this? Or, or it does the other way around or the opposite of that? The, is God glorified when we tell our stories of life and how we, you know, cope up with the different struggles in, in this life? Is God encouraged? This morning, my brothers and sisters, I want to encourage or I want to suggest a certain lens by which we tell our stories. This is a lens that would truly help, you know, others in times of great difficulties and great problems. This is a lens that would point them to the hope that is the Lord Jesus Christ that will glorify our God. It, it began with a prayer from Paul. Again, this is part two of what was preached yesterday. A prayer of Paul that was uh, given to the, the Ephesians believers, to the believers that will read the letters and the believers all over the world during that time and up until now. It's a prayer of enlightenment, a prayer of realization, a realization that could never, never be forced, that you can do on your own, but it is a, a kind of enlightenment only the power of the Holy Spirit can make us realize. And this is where the riches, the true riches of a believer 
is located. It's actually in us and with us already as we profess and live out our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we will never realize that it is within us already unless there is the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit that, uh, that, that will come in us. And this is the prayer, exactly why the prayer of Paul was uttered in these verses. There's three things here that Paul wants us to be enlightened with. With the true riches of the believer of Lord Jesus Christ. Three riches of a believer as revealed by the Holy Spirit. Number one, it is the riches when it, that, that talks about hope. A steadfast, a strong kind of a hope that no one could ever shake. Paul says in verse 18a, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling. This kind of hope, again, is already upon the believers, the genuine believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, sealed by the Holy Spirit. But unless the Holy Spirit will enlighten us, we will never, be, we will never realize that it is there all along. We continue to live a kind of a defeated, a life full of worries, a life full of fear because of everything that is going on around us. But once the illuminating power of the Spirit is revealed in our lives, we get to understand that there is this hope, a hope that looks forward to the future where everything will be reconciled, where there will be a reconciliation, not just with our bodies, with our lives, but the lives of the Christians of the church and also with creation. There will be a restoration that will happen. Though it may be the future completion of that will be in the future, but this is hope that gives a kind of hopeful attitude now. In face of many dangers, in face of many problems in life, this hope is steadfast, immovable. And it just radiates upon the life of a believer that we will live out a life full of you know, joy and hope that others will see a steadfast kind of a hope, a kind of hope that will allow us to persevere with joy and contentment, no matter how high the fuel will be in the future. Hope set on solid ground because all other ground are sinking sand. Walay lain. But it's the rock, the solid rock, there is the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, um, for the Golden State Warriors fan here, many of you are rejoicing. For uh, in game six, you know, nadaog nagyod. Last year, many, um, according to Steph Curry, many talking heads gave them zero chance of uh, being champions. But those, you know, those three key people in um, the Golden State Warriors believe Curry, see Green, and uh, Thompson. And it's the whole of, actually, the whole of the organization. And they place their hope and trust in the organization that will carry them through uh, many adversities and they became champions. It was one of the sweetest or probably the sweetest championship that they ever experienced. But then, brothers and sisters, our God is, you know, more than just the Golden State Warriors organization. He is the solid rock that could never be shaken. And if our hope is anchored upon Him, you know, the Golden State Warrior is just like a sand in comparison to this solid rock that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we put our hope in Him, we will continue, we will be able to you know, push through, persevere, no matter the discouragements around us, no matter the you know, uh, uh, unfavorable circumstances that may come our way, we push through, we continue on with joy and contentment because of this illuminating power of the Spirit that will make us understand that there is hope. And if you, you know, in your small groups, oftentimes we have our prayer request times. 
Now, I believe this should be number one. More than just asking for provision of our needs and all that. You pray for an enlightenment of the Spirit. That you may understand that you have the true riches. You know, the un incomparable riches that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it will make you hopeful. A hopeful attitude that will become a blessing to other people. The second um, uh, uh, wonderful blessings, rich blessing uh, that comes only from the enlightenment of the Spirit is this shared inheritance. A shared inheritance. This is part of the prayer of Paul that we will be enlightened and we will know what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. It is more than just looking forward to this uh, great you know, hope in the future, an eternal life, but it is a gracious endowment of identity now. Before we were wretched, we were rebels in the eyes of God, but because of His grace, oh sweet, amazing grace of God, He has adopted us into His family, and now we are children of God. We are His children because of this wonderful work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He has adopted us and we are now able to walk intimately with God. You cannot do that. We cannot do that before. You know, we were outcasts. We were rebels. The wrath of God is upon us. But because of this endowment of identity, that we are now His children, adopted children, we can now walk closely with God and we can experience the sweetness of His presence. And not only that, we are able to experience the sweet fellowship of the church as well. We can experience the joy because other people are enjoying in life or experiencing the victories of blessing. We experience that as well as part of the body of Christ. We can also go through sorrows of other people. We share one on one another's pain and joy. All that because of this shared inheritance that we have. A new endowment of identity that comes from the Lord. And most of all, there is this peace. This peace that we could never you know, put into words. Jesus says in His words to His disciples, all these things he has taught them. It is because for one reason, and that reason is so that they may find peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, in this world, you will have troubles and tribulations. But take courage, take heart, Jesus said, because he has overcome the world. And this peace, no matter the wars that is around us, no matter if Russia will decide again to invade different places or China or whatever country uh, will invade other countries, this peace that comes from inside, we have that, my brothers and sisters. And if the Holy Spirit, we pray, that's why we pray, that the Holy Spirit will make us understand that all these things, the riches of His glory might be upon us. You know, this inheritance is owned by Christ. Christ owned this. It's, it's His. But because of His grace, He shared it to us. And we are able to experience it now. A glorious riches that comes from the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is the true riches of the Christian life that no amount of money can buy. You know, different countries would you know, um, shell out millions and even billions and trillions of money for peace and order. Yet, they can never, you know, um, solve the deepest problems and turmoils of the heart of a person. Only Jesus can do that. And this is the true riches of Christian life that no amount of money can buy.
the third riches that we have, that only through the illuminating of the Holy Spirit that we can understand and we may know is in the area of this superintending power, the power of help. The, Paul continued to pray that we may know what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe, towards us who believe. You know, there are many powers of this world. Probably in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, I know that we will go through that. The different powers that are in this world. You know, we have the powers of the kings and the princes and the princes of this world. The powers of presidents and prime ministers in political countries that somehow some would, you know, abuse their powers. We have powers that not just on the physical world, but on a metaphysical plane. The powers of the spirit and the devil that is led by Satan himself. And we have also the powers of nature that we are bounded with. The laws of this nature. But the power of God surpasses, greatly surpasses all of these powers that we see and we feel in this world. And this God-enabling power gives a believer, you and me, the courage, the strength, and the perseverance so that we may fulfill His calling in our lives. So that as we live lives in this earth, no matter how hard you know, the circumstances may be, we will not just you know, go on life surviving, but we will go on our lives thriving because we have this surpassing and superintending power that comes from the greatest power there ever is, comes from God. He's there to help us, aid us in times, in every, in every moment, especially in the times that we need Him the most. This superintending power that will not just make us survive, but thrive, you know. How many of us here are surviving through life? You know, we have this mindset that, you know, if I just, if it's just, you know, 15 and the last month, kasurvive yung ko karong adlawa. Or karong si manaha, karong bulana. That's a survival kind of an attitude. But when we realize this gift and this riches of God in our lives, we will thrive in life. You know? We will realize that no matter how hard life is, taas kayo, maglakaw na ko, nag-invite ra ba o wider group, layo man to niya, mahal kayong gasolina, so I will walk. I will ride my bicycle. I will go there no matter what happens because I know that I am designed by the Lord Jesus Christ towards maturity into being you know, part of the kingdom work towards maturity and this is the kind of life that God designed me. This is my life when I will be in His presence forever and ever. A life that is mature in the Lord, working for His glory and for His honor, which is why we continue on. We thrive more than just, you know, surviving. We thrive. Brothers and sisters, all these three things are upon a believer already. This riches, we have it already. It takes only the power of the Holy Spirit to make our spiritual eyes see that it is there. So we pray. We ask the Lord, Lord, open my spiritual eyes that I may see. I guess the next question that we want to ask is how reliable are these riches to us? How do we know that it's true? How do we know that it's real in our lives? Now, Paul gives us an answer. In verse 19b, he says there, these, all these are in accordance with the working of the strength of His might. The strength of His might. You know, James Watt, when he, um, during the height of his, you know, inventing power, he tried to measure, you know, he tried to put a description on energy. How do you measure energy? So what he did was that he used a horse, an adult horse, put a, um, a rope on that horse and tied it on a, 
um, you know, a heavy stuff. He tried it from uh, 250 kilos or below, and then, uh, so he made experiments. He tied it on like a rooftop, and then uh, when the thing that he tied, you know, the horse into is greater than 250 kilos, the horse is not able to lift it up. But when it's 250 kilos, the horse is able to lift it up around one foot, one foot. Uh, which is why when you look at our air conditioning today, we, we see or we, we read of words such as one horsepower, two horsepower, three horsepower, and there are even cars and jet planes that are more than, more than hundred uh, and thou even thousands of horsepower. That's how he, the way he measured the power of energy. But how do we measure the power of God? Have you ever asked that? How do you measure the power of God, the strength of His might? How do you measure that? How reliable are these riches to us? If we try to, you know, measure the power of God, how do we do that? Well, let me suggest we measure it by this word, the word favorite ni Pastor Joe, the word is providence. We measure God's power by His providence. Now, what is providence? If you look into the Bible and look into every word from Old Testament to New Testament, you will never encounter the exact words providence. Just like the word trinity, you can never see that there. But the whole concept and thumbprints of God when it comes to His providential power is very clear from Genesis up to Revelation. There are many examples and many stories you can look into and see how the providence of God is working. But let me bring to you uh, to Genesis 22. It is during the time when God, uh, I mean, God tested Abraham so that he will, you know, and he told his Ab Abraham to, you know, bring your child to a certain mountain, the child whom you love, the, your firstborn that you love so much. Sundugan kay si God during that time, gibalik balik niya. Your firstborn, the one you love, you that you love so much. Bring them to the, bring him to that mountain and sacrifice him for me. And Abraham did that and he went to that mountain. And at the moment where he would, he is ready, he's about to strike. An angel of the Lord came and said, "Stop, Abraham." Don't do that. God is only testing you. And right at, at that time, there was a ram that was caught by a tree. And instead of his son Isaac, whom he loves, <laughs> it was the ram that he was able to uh, sacrifice to the Lord. And there, Abraham, in, Gen in verse 14 of Genesis chapter 22, so Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The Latin, uh, it's, uh, the word providence actually came from a Latin called provide. Same as provide, provide. But uh, the, the word provide is a compound word, compound word, pro, uh, forward. It means forward or on behalf of. And the word vide is to see. Looking into these two words put together, we see God seeing to the future, you know, his foreknowledge, his knowledge of every minute detail that will happen in this world, his omniscience. He knows, he sees, that is what this word provide uh, means. But then, if you look into it, somehow there is a passive sense of it. You know, only God sees, God sees. So what? So John Piper, um, he tried to, you know, to give a, to suggest that it's more than just seeing, but it is within this idiom called, I'll see to it. You know, some of you are employees and employers. When you want something done as an employer, you call on to your employee, and the best answer, possible answer that you can get is when your employee would say, Sir, ma'am, I'll see to it that what you wish for will be done. I'll see to it. John Piper uh, gave a suggestion 
that the meaning of the word provide is God seeing to it. God sees to it that whatever He has planned and declared even before creation will come to pass. It will happen. And you know what? God has never failed yet. He has never failed yet. And He will see to it that it will be done. The best description that we can see of the word providence is in... Um, Sorry, I can't click it. Palihug ko at the back. So it's in the Westminster Confession. There you go. Westminster Confession of Faith in 1646, where it says, God, the great creator of all things, doth uphold, direct, dispose, govern all creatures, actions, and things. From the greatest even to the least, by His most wise and holy providence, according to His infallible foreknowledge and the free and immutable counsel of His own will, to the praise of His glory, to the praise of the glory. There is a purpose of why providence happens, of this providential power of God. The purpose is, is that to the praise of His glory, of His wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. And for those who are seeking that God will be glorified, it will be joy for them to see the God, that God's providential plan unfolding. And those are the believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are hoping that God will be glorified. Everything that we do in life is for the glory of God. When God does, is glorified, it will be a joy for us. Well, that's why those three things that Paul is praying for, it will happen to us because it is sure that God will be glorified. And our hope is in that. Our shared inheritance, joy, peace is upon that. This Westminster Confession of Faith tells us that the providential power of God, the strength of His might, is upon the greatest event and even to the least of the events, even to the minute atomic details in our lives. What does that mean? It means that even the bubbles of the soda that you drank this morning or you will drink this afternoon, even the bubbles of that, God is governing and sustaining all that. When you are there in your garden in uh, in your rest house, sa Claveria, you know, and you are trying to do your gardening, and every moist, every fog that you see there, that is the power of God governing and sustaining all of those. Even to the minute detail. Kung masubraan kag kapi, unya gapitik pitik imong mata, ug ang imong kasing kasing, all of that is governed and sustained by the power of our God. See how powerful and amazing our God is. Even to the atomic detail, God's providential power is present. You know what? In Daniel chapter 7, the ancient of days, when God was there, He passed on all authority, all power. He passed on to the Son of Man who comes with the clouds, you know, from the clouds. He passed on to the Son of Man, whom we know now as the Lord Jesus Christ. Which is why in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, 16 to 17, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, it, say, it says there, For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. And not only created, He is before all things and in Him all things hold together. Every event in the whole history of this world is governed and sustained by the provid providential power of the Son of God, the Son of Man, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's the kicker. When Jesus Christ became a man, He was here physically. 
He was here with us, but He never ceased to be God. You know what that means? While He was here on earth ministering to man, still, every minute event, detail on this whole universe, Jesus Christ is still upholding or was still upholding and sustaining all of them while he was here. You know, that's mind-boggling. Imagine during the time when he was beaten you know, by the Roman whip. You know that every uh, sweat that came out from the Roman, Roman soldier who whipped the Lord Jesus Christ It's the providential power of Jesus who is governing and sustaining that man. Every blood that came out of the Lord Jesus Christ as he was suffering, it was his providential power who is governing and sustaining all that. You know what seems to be the darkest event in the whole of history? The darkest event when the Son of God was being beaten crucified to death. He died. By God's providential power, He turned all that and it became the greatest event man has ever ever witnessed. What does that mean to us now? The greatest or darkest moment of our history, because of the providential of God, it turned out to be the greatest event of our lives, of the lives of the world. Whatever it is, how dark the things that you are going through right now. When we see things with the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit, knowing the providential power of God, why, why, should, we get, why, why should we worry? Why should we, we be afraid? God can turn all that. He did that to Christ. Can't He not do it in what we are going through right now? We have a powerful God. The strength of His might measured by His providence. In fact, we cannot fathom the providence of God. We could never you know, understand how He's governing and sustaining of everything really works. But then knowing all these things, this can be mind-boggling truths that is revealed to us in the Bible. And all this because of two truths about the reality of the believer's riches. Number one, it is through Christ. It's Christ. He has won them through the resurrection. Remember that the providential work of God will end in, his, in Him being glorified. And it is through the Lord Jesus Christ that maximum glory was given to God. And Christ has won them through the resurrection. That is verse 22, I think. Sorry, not 20. The second one is His rule. His rule dominates all creation. Whether you like it or not, whether you you, um, accept that you are under God's rule or whether you reject God's rule like many people do, we are all under this power, the great power of our God. And He dominates all creation. But for us who is in the church, Jesus is the head of our church. And when we realize that this truth, you know, that we have, that Christ rules, Jesus rules over all the universe, it gives us joy. It gives us hope. It gives us peace that no matter the circumstance that we may be in, God is in control. His providential power reigns above every power. So brothers and sisters in the Lord, remember this. The believer's true riches are found in the victory and authority of Christ. Victory and authority of Christ. Diha na to mabatunan. If the Holy Spirit will enlighten us and make us realize that, you know, the riches of God is more than just money. It could never be bought by money. It is found in the victory and the authority of Christ. Now, there is this author. His name is uh, 
Charles Taylor. Charles Taylor. He authored a book named Modern Social Imaginaries. He coined the word social imaginary. Social imaginary. And um, let me explain it through just a question. Kanina, we asked the question, what stories do we tell? But this is more on who gets to tell the story. In what interpretative frame do we tell the stories of everything that happens in this world, in these events that we have in this world? Who gets to tell story, the story? Oftentimes, we go to the news, the media. The story of this happened and that happened. And many times, and many people have lost their trust in the media because of, you know, the biases and all of that. Also, the natural science has a story to tell. And many of that, are, uh, our kids listen to those stories. You know, when, we get, when, when they go to school, the natural sa- science have their own stories. The problem is when they s- tell the story of evolution and all that. Social media have their own stories, and many of them are made by trolls. But who gets to tell the story? What stories should we tell as disciples of God? Now let me suggest that the story we tell or the interpretative frame by which we tell our stories should be under the strength of the might of God the providential power of God, that everything happens in this world, God knows about it, and He sees to it that whatever He has planned before, it will be done. And everything that happens will be for the good of those who love Him and who are called for His purposes. That is the interpretative frame by which we tell the story of this world. It's us, the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, who must tell, who must tell, who should tell the story of God. You know, it's not a lie, you know. Many stories that, you know, other people would tell, many of them are true, you know. Many are lies, but there are some who are true in media and all that. But there is a grander story. A bigger story, a bigger story of God sending His own Son for the redemption of many, the redemption of creation. And we, the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, are supposed to tell that story, a hopeful story, story of courage, of perseverance, of thriving and not just surviving. Because of this grace that we have experienced through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, you tell that story. Stop telling stories of fear and anxieties. Yes, those things might be true around us, but push further. Tell the grander story of God's amazing grace and love found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And pray that we might understand this so that we might be able to tell this beautiful story of God. Will you tell the great story of God's might? Will you tell that story? Now, tomorrow, next week, will you continue to tell that great story of God's might? Let us pray. We praise you, Father, for you have called us to participate in your great story. We are not worthy, Lord. But because of your grace, it's all by your grace that we are now part of this kingdom work, that we get to live out the story of how Jesus changed us, and that we might be able to tell this story of love so that others might experience it as well. But prior to that, Lord, I pray also that your Holy Spirit will enlighten us. Make us understand the true riches of your glory that we have in Christ, sealed by the Holy Spirit. 
help us to tell this wonderful story not in the lens of fear and worry, but in the, lo- in the lens of God's great, amazing love. The grand story of redemption. And we pray, Lord, that all glory and honor you might receive. I know, we know that you will receive it, Lord. And thank you for allowing us to be part of that. People who can give glory to your name. We praise you and we thank you. To you be the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.